everyone. Thank you so much for joining our final session of Cherry Beckard's New Markets Tax Credit Virtual Series. My name is Madeline Robbins, and I'm our production manager here at Cherry Beckard. This virtual series is dedicated to community development, organizations, and companies interested in or currently involved in New Markets Tax Credit. The series has provided a wealth of information and also CPE uh, free of charge. So with that, let's go ahead and touch on the CPE. To receive CPE credit, you must answer at least three of the four polling questions and attend for the full 15 minutes. Those certificates will be issued via email within 10 days. If you haven't received yours after 10 days, you can email cbhlearning at cbh.com. A recorded version of the webinar will also be available in about a week. It'll be sent via email and posted to our website. Now, if you have any questions during the webinar, type those in the Q&A window that's located down at the bottom of your control panel. A reminder, a short survey will also be available at the conclusion. We value your feedback and just hope that you take part. Now it's time to introduce our speakers today. We have Laurel uh, joining us today, uh, Strategic Tax Director with Cherry Beckert along with Jason, uh, Strategic Tax Manager at Cherry Beckert. Please take it away. Thanks, Patty. So, um, and, and hello everyone. I'm excited so many of you have joined virtually today. I hope both Laurel and myself can provide some insights that will uh, help advance your organizations in your next steps in community development. So um, here's our agenda for today, and I will, uh, so I will outline some of the building blocks for becoming a certified CDFI or CDE, and then we will give it back the mic over to Laurel, who will share a lot of her experiences growing community development organizations, including how to better understand uh, the foundation of your organization and, and keys to kind of measured and calculated growth for an organization in this community development space. Uh, so on to polling question number one to get us kicked off here for all of you with CPE. Um, what are you most interested in learning about today? Uh, is it CDE, Community Development Entity Certification Requirements? Uh, is it that measured growth uh, reforms to the CDFI uh, certification or targeting community outcomes or all of the above? And we'll just give everyone, um, you know, about 30 more seconds here to uh, answer that question and we'll dive into the material. Okay, and we are getting ready to end the poll and share our results. There we go, all of the above. So everyone is excited as I am to get started today and um, hopefully we can provide you some good nuggets to um, take from this presentation. So, um, so as we dive into organizations next steps in community development, is, it's really important for us to level set for our conversation today. You know, community development is a very broad term. Uh, it can really mean many different things to many different people. Um, Fortune 500 companies joining today, tuning in today, are going to have a much different view than the local nonprofit who is really working with, uh, you know, getting human resources and social resources to, to the organization. So, but for our discussion today, we're really going to be focused on organizations with uh, intentional efforts to drive those financial assets to those underserved communities with added benefits of kind of being accountable to those communities they serve and how, how we can best grow those entities to really turn those underserved communities into fully served communities. Um, so that really leads us in nicely to the discussion of the CDFI fund and the CDFI industry as a whole. CDFI is a community development financial institution. Um, the CDFI fund is an arm of the Department of U.S. Treasury, and they manage 10 separate programs authorized by six different statutes and they're tasked with certifying CDFIs. Uh, and we hear from lots of different organizations asking if becoming a CDFI is really the right step for them. A lot of people are, you know, hey, they hear a lot of good things about CDFIs, you know, should we become a CDFI? What, what's it take to become a CDFI? So just uh, definition purposes, you know, a community development financial institution 
they have a primary mission of expanding economic opportunity in low-income communities by providing access to financial products and services for residents and businesses. So CDFIs can be banks, credit unions, uh, loan funds, micro loan funds, venture capital providers, and there are over 1,400 CDFIs throughout the United States, and they can be found in all 50 states, including Guam and Puerto Rico. Uh, about 42% of those are loan funds and of some kind, and then 34% are credit unions. So CDFIs continue to provide those loans and other forms of financial assistance to individuals, small businesses, community organizations, allowing them to access the capital they need to start or expand their businesses, um, create jobs, and stimulate economic growth. Uh, they offer technical assistance also for financial education in communities that are overlooked uh, or underserved by traditional financial institutions. CDFIs are primarily funded through um, government grants and programs, but private investment is crucial for CDFIs to continue their mission. Uh, private investment from banks is, is usually one of the key players and can be a key component in growing a CDFI's asset base. Providing capital to the CDFI while helping fulfill larger banks' um, CRA requirements. Uh, more and more banks are also utilizing these relationships as a way to express their commitment um, in corporate social responsibility. Um, as ESG goals and things like that continue to grow, um, banks partnering with CDFIs has become um, very lucrative for both sides. So as a whole, the CDFI industry has nearly $247 billion in total assets with a net worth of over $34 billion. Um, in summary, CDFIs really have grown to become the backbone of getting financial services to these underserved communities. But that's not really the only way that your organization can, um, you know, invest in communities and in lending and investing. Uh, there's many different avenues for organizations to work and drive those resources to underserved communities beyond becoming a CDFI. Uh, for those of you that have been with us from the beginning of the webinar series, you know our affinity for the new market tax credit program, which is also allocated by the CDFI fund. And we'll discuss um, what's needed to start and grow a community development entity that uh, wins allocation. But uh, how we're, there are also numerous other ways, like I mentioned. Organizations can participate in community lending or investing. There are ever-increasing demand for sustainable and impactful investments, whether from institutional investors or private capital. Uh, ESG goals are simply not going away, and community development organizations, uh, whether a CDFI or not, will continue to play key roles in de deploying that capital. So. Um, on to the CDFI requirements. So if you are interested in becoming a CDFI, what does that take? Um, in order to become a certified CDFI, there are a number of requirements that need to be met. Um, in order to be eligible to apply, an entity must be a legal entity, have a primary mission of promoting community development, financing entity. You must provide some education or developmental services, um, primary, primarily serve one or more target markets. Uh, maintain accountability to those target markets, and you are a non-governmental entity. So for the target market criteria, CDFI must direct at least 60% of both the number and dollar volume of its financial products to its target markets. Um, you either need to serve investments areas in, or targeted populations. An investment area would need to meet uh, one of the economic distress criteria, so greater than 20% poverty rate, uh, median family income at 80% or less, of the area median, uh, median family income or unemployment at one and a half the national average. Um, you can also serve targeted populations, so which can either be the low income population as a whole or specifically identified populations, African American, Hispanic, or Indigenous American. So one of those requirements, uh, developmental services, as I mentioned, um, a CDFI must provide some educational or development services, things such as credit counseling, financial education, real estate technical assistance. Uh, the key here is that the CDFIs are very proud to say that they are providing more than just the needed credit. They provide the coaching, the expertise to help people thrive. So if you're considering becoming a CDFI, uh, this will be a key consideration. Are you already offering some of those services in the community? That's great. Or is, is there somewhere uh, your organization needs to build internal capacity to offer said services? Now, uh, as with most things in our world today, there are uh, changes on the horizon. And the next slide, we're talking about reforms to the CDFI certification. And the CDFI fund is revising the certification process with the goal of strengthening accountability and transparency throughout the industry, as well as streamlining the application process. So the stated policy objectives of the CDFI fund are to protect the CDFI brand, 
uh, support growth and reach of their CDFIs, foster diversity of CDFI types, activities, and geographies, uh, minimize the burden on CDFIs while improving data quality and collection methods, you know, proving out their the impact in the communities, and promote uh, efficiency for CDFI fund staff. So what updates are being made? Um, <clears throat> there are several updates coming to the primary mission section of the application. So as part of their brand protection goal, the changes in the section are really meant to strengthen the primary mission test. The major change that's coming from the CDFI fund is that now require board approved strategic plan evidence, evidencing uh, community development strategies. So uh, you really will be deemed ineligible for certification without such a plan. So uh, that's one of the major changes. Also in that section, there's gonna be so-called bright line questions. Um, these questions were really meant as a test for potential CDFIs um, show that the responsible financing practices are in place, um, which really is a prerequisite for being a CDFI. Uh, things such as are your loan products, do they allow for an APR over 36%, you know, things like that. And, and really the CDFI is trying to get at, do you also consider the borrower's ability to repay? Um, the CDFI fund is serving low-income people, low-income communities, um, but we, we aren't just giving that money away. It is still considered a loan and having policies and procedures in place and having um, experienced loan professionals on hand is also key to becoming a CDFI. So another change um, that will take place in the certification is a required minimum of 12 months of financial product or financial services activity prior to the submission of your CDFI certification application. Um, that's that's going to be a new one, and I think it's a welcomed one. There are also changes to the target market assessment methodologies that I mentioned earlier. Uh, the revised application expands opportunities to receive target market credit, which is uh, a welcomed addition, as well as allowing certified CDFIs to meet uh, various thresholds based on a three-year rolling average. So the proposals allow for a little bit more flexibility. Uh, it allows for the use of financial services to meet that target market test that we mentioned earlier. Um, and then the last section uh, changes to the accountability section have been designed to increase the emphasis on the use of governing boards to demonstrate that accountability to their underserved target markets. Uh, it also allows advisory board options for banks and credit unions, which wasn't there before. So uh, these revisions have been a long time coming. In May 2020, the CDFI fund released proposed changes. Public comments and reviews got us to a new draft of the application last October. And the CDFI fund expects to now open the new certification process in the fall of 2023. Um, for those interested in this process, there is an expected update coming on Monday. Um, they recently, the recently established CDFI certification subcommittee will present its official recommendations during the public meeting on Monday. And you can um, find more information about that at cdfifund.gov. Uh, so that was a lot of information and clearly not an exhaustive list of all the changes. Um, if, if you're looking to become a certified CDFI, you know, as the new certification comes out in, in the fall, I would uh, definitely try and get some counsel or some consulting work done um, prior to that coming out. Lots of changes have come out. Um, another key note for existing CDFIs is there will be a grace period for you to apply for certification under the new application. So existing CDFIs are going to need to recertify, um, but there will have a grace period to do that. All right, so on to the next slide. Why, why get certified? You know, and hopefully it's apparent at this point, but uh, it really opens your organization up to a menu of awards available through the CDFI fund, things like the bond guarantee program, which helps capitalize your CDFIs and provide that needed capital to the low income communities. Um, but further, it, you get the CDFI brand. And as we've been discussing, it carries a lot of weight. It will be much easier to secure private financing and investments um, when you are tagged as a CDFI. And then if you are a CDFI, you do have some reporting responsibilities. Uh, CDFIs must recertify through the annual certification uh, data collection report, uh, which really tracks financial health of the CDFI, portfolio level information. Um, reporting is required to show compliance to award agreements and things like that. Um, you've uh, dependent on each specific award program, you might have different reporting requirements, but the use of your award performance uh, financial statement, uh, audit submissions, and transaction level reports. 
Right. As I mentioned earlier, so one key on the next slide, one key uh, grant program for anyone that's thinking of becoming a CDFI or emerging CDFI. Um, the new guidance requires that 12 months of financing services or um, or lending prior to applying to become a CDFI. So, however, the CDFI fund does offer a technical assistance grant, which emerging CDFIs can apply for. And to be eligible for the technical assistance grant, uh, emerging CDFIs must demonstrate that they have the ability to become a certified CDFI within a three years of receiving the grant. So this is a really a great first step for new CDFIs as you need to produce a plan toward becoming a CDFI. And while you do not uh, need to demonstrate a track record of lending um, for your application, um, you will outline that plan, building your organization capacity to provide uh, new lending products. Last year, the CDFI fund awarded 218 organizations over 27 million technical assistance awards. And those funds can be used for all sorts of different capacity building projects, consulting, contracting services, salaries, training costs, equipment and supplies. Uh, really a great way to uh, help get a new CDFI started. So certified CDFIs can also apply for this, but they can apply for both financial assistance grants and technical assistance grants. All right. That moves us on to um, the other designation bestowed by the CDFI fund, which is a community development entity. Uh, as defined by the CDFI fund, it's a, it's a domestic corporation or partnership as an intermediary, intermediary vehicle for the provision of loans, investments, or financial counseling in low-income communities. So CDEs may be uh, newly created organizations that are controlled by for-profit, nonprofit, or even a governmental organization. Uh, the primary benefit of being certified is the ability to apply for new market tax credit allocation, to offer that to investors in exchange for equity investments in uh, low-income uh, businesses. The new market program is designed in a way to allow for local knowledge and expertise to decide which businesses then to best invest in. Um, the structure of the NMTC program was covered extensively in our previous webinars, so I would, if you missed those, I would highly recommend going back and watching uh, those statements, but of note here is that you do not have to be a CDFI in order to be a CDE. While CDFIs are automatically treated as qualified uh, CDEs uh, and can apply for new market allocation. Um, in order to be an eligible uh, certified CDE, you must be a legal entity, have a primary mission of serving or providing investment capital to those low-income communities or persons, and you must maintain account accountability to your residents of low-income communities through representation on any governing board or advisory board. Uh, that first portion, the primary mission, is known as the primary mission test. Generally, that includes providing organizational documents that demonstrate the CDE's mission of directly serving or providing investment capital to those low-income communities. Generally, this includes something along the lines of submitting organizational documents or board-approved bylaws showing that mission. Uh, the other part of the certification is called the accountability test, which generally requires that an advisory board uh, includes representation of members that represent the low-income communities they serve. The threshold requirement here is 20% of the board members need to represent the low-income communities or people they serve. While uh, in practice, we see most CDEs have closer to 100% representation on their advisory board. Um, the NMTC application process, as you will recall, is a very competitive process. Uh, in the last allocation round uh, we announced in 2022, applicants had a 53.8% success rate, which was actually up from 48% in the prior year. Uh, last year, 199 applicants requested nearly $15 billion in allocation authority for the $5 billion in authority that was available. So it's quite a competitive process that relies on CDE's track record, pipeline of projects, and, and background. So I would also yet again point everyone back to the previous presentation on compliance reporting and applications where we go through the application process and provide some really wonderful insights on uh, what makes a strong application. Um, I think that gets us on to polling question number two. Uh, which of the following is not a stated primary objective of the coming CDFI certification reforms? So we'll see if you were uh, paying attention during that, but is it to is it not to A, foster diversity of CDFI types, activities, and geographies, minimize the burden on CDFIs while improving data quality, or protect, protect the CDFI brand, uh, support the growth and reach of CDFIs, or E, limit the number of CDFIs? We'll just give uh, 30 seconds or so here for um, people to answer that question.
Well, there's usually no right or wrong answer. <laughs> Here there's there is and and looks like everybody got a good a chunk of that limit limit the number of CDFIs is not the reason for this going so uh, it looks like everybody answered and um, we're now moving along Jason thanks for tearing everybody through that um, becoming a CDFI is certainly a um, a big step and so. Sometimes when you're thinking about taking that big step, what you really need to do is assess where you are and what your foundation is. So the next step in thinking about, hey, do you want to take this on? Do you want to either you know, be, be a CDE or a CDFI and which way you should you go is really to think about what type of organizational structure you have, what products, services, um, community are you serving, and where do you feel like the natural growth is for your organization? So thinking about it as um, a building. If you're going to build a first floor, you have to have a foundation usually. Otherwise, you start to build on and on and you find that your structure is not solid and things fall apart. So if you have an organization that's already been raising capital, it's already been providing services into the low income community, you need to really assess how is that going for you? What, what are you work? What's working well? What's not working? And think about where you want to go and where you think that there's something missing in your community because frankly that's one of the biggest things I see in the community work I've done over the last 20 plus years is you go into a community and you find somebody who has this great idea and you ask them have they talked to anybody else in the community about what they're doing um, how does this fit with the other programming the other services offered and if you're doing something that's being done down the road is that really even necessary or how are you going to distinguish yourself from what's being offered from somebody else so really taking that as a first step. Um, I I, uh, I had a great piece of advice given to me once, which is, you know, really figure out where you want to go and where are you now? Because if you don't do that, you can't really chart the direct course. If you don't know where you have had success and where you are feeling like there is a need for your services, and then you just chart a course, you may miss a few key milestones along the way. Often what I find is somebody says they want to be um, serving a community or they want to do environmentally sustainable outcomes and that's really important to them, but they haven't been measuring that. They haven't been looking at that. They haven't been really focused on that. So it's wonderful that that's a desire, but you actually have to build that foundation. So really starting with a critical look at your strengths and weaknesses, gathering um, the right tools. So if you say to yourself, what you really wanna do is have a wonderful, robust lending program, but you have nobody who underwrites or understands the ability to repay, as Jason mentioned, you know, borrowers, um, you're not making grants. So you have to look at whether they have the ability to, based on what they're doing, be able to repay you if you make a loan. Um, you also have to Understand the various industries. If you say to yourself, you want to be in that environmentally sustainable outcome area, but you don't really understand the metrics and tools of that, you don't understand the technology or other things, then you need to add um, you know, those resources to your team. That can either be somebody internally to your team, you hire an expert or you hire a consultant or you get that expertise in some way, but you can't just start making loans on brand new technology without understanding whether that technology works. Um, had uh, have an example from my own background where we had a wonderful new piece of technology and unfortunately, you know, they couldn't get to the right level that they needed to of quality. Well, that's huge. That's huge. If, if you can't get to the right level of quality, you can't sell the product. So understanding that technology and understanding whether um, what somebody says they want to do will work is, is really important. And then again, if you have aspirational goals that are huge, that's wonderful. I mean, I want to change the world. I want world peace. But can I achieve that tomorrow? Probably not. So thinking about where you are today and what's the next benchmark. Uh, if you don't set benchmarks in between your audacious goal and where you are today, then you'll find, and I've seen this with other companies who say they want to do something, but they don't really know what the pieces of that puzzle are. They don't know what the next step or the building blocks are to get to where they are. And you check back in with them after a year and they're no closer to the end goal than they were a year before, even though they had the best of intentions, they may have even done a plan that said they needed this to happen, but they have no idea about how to make that happen. And so it's really about looking at a year and saying, okay, well, what first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, fourth quarter, what should I hit on each of these things? And not just 
what do I need to do, but what's that going to cost me? <laughs> um, the wonderful part of this is to think about, okay, well, maybe I don't have the funds to do every part of it, but as uh, Jason mentioned, there's a technical assistance grant from the CDFI fund if you want to become a CDFI. There are also other grant programs. There are other interested organizations in the community that wellness that may help you with the budgeting. Um, if you're a nonprofit, you know, capital campaigns can help you or donations. And if you're a for-profit entity, how are you currently existing and making money? And do you have extra from that that you can reinvest into yourself to broaden your foundation? Um, I also find that again, if you don't look at the holistic what you're looking to achieve, you may get a great, um, you may have a great product and you may make 10 loans. But if you haven't thought about what your service area is, you may find that some of those loans won't really be assistance to you because you didn't think about what really your service area is and where you want to be. So you may have made um, loans outside of the area that's really going to be your core and key area. If you think about um, Hey, I, I'm 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 just going to make a lot of great loans to a lot of great people. When you go to really assessing what impacts are you trying to accomplish, you may have a great um, you know smorgasbord, but you may not really have depth in any particular area, which makes it really hard if you want to, as your next stated goal, uh, enter into the new market tax credit program. So if what you wanted to do is become a, a CDE or a CDFI that then gets an award of new markets, and you have 10 different community outcomes, but you don't measure them, you don't have depth in any of the areas, and you don't have a track record that you can really speak to, then you haven't really set yourself up for a successful application. So what I tell people is, you know, layer those goals. What is your number one priority? Um, you have to have a product, and then you have to have the community outcomes that you're tracking, and those have to be sort of what's your key and top. That doesn't mean if your key um, area is, again, um, job creation, that you can't also think about some other aspect of community investment, but you have to have data on that main point so that you're building depth and you have a track record because that's the key component of a successful application is the CDFI fund wants to award people who have had a track record, who've successfully administered a program and produced outcomes with that that they have tracked those outcomes, they have data to show, and that they will then be able to tell the CDFI fund, if you give me the new market tax credits, I can do the same thing with that funding. I can now level up, I can have a larger pool of funds to invest, but I, I already know what I'm gonna be looking for and I have a program already established. Um, a lot of that, again, goes to management capacity and finances. Uh, what is your team as far as employees directly on hand? And what is your consultant um, or what's your um, accounting? When is, who's your lawyer? You have to have that entire um, team in place in order to successfully uh, move to the next step. Uh, mission, vision, and values are something that I put at the beginning. So that's one of the first things we mentioned, but it's also something to keep uh, thinking through. So when you think about all these things, think about how you are building on to your mission, vision, and values or redirecting it slightly because of things that have happened. But you have to keep that core framework because if you stray too far too fast, you'll find that, that can't, that's not a successful uh, way to get allocation from the new market tax credit um, program. And it also uh, can can be detrimental to you in other ways if you sort of stray too far and you don't really um, have that foundation under you. Um, we've talked a lot about outcomes. We, as Jason mentioned, we've this is our fourth in our four part series. So we've had several other presentations and we won't get into this too much because we've covered the outcomes in other of our um, series. But I think it's important to remember that we are talking about community engagement and outcomes because we're not talking about just traditional lending where you just make a loan and if they can pay you back you don't care whether they're perhaps you know um going to be uh, involved in a sin business or they are going to uh, you know a cannabis industry or they're in a golf course or there's something else and you or some other traditional form of 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 um, out, um activity business but not something that's going to produce a benefit to the low income community. We're always thinking about that second step. It's not just a business, but what is that business or operation or organization or nonprofit going to be doing 
that's benefiting the the um, low income community in some way. So small businesses, mixed use developments, affordable housing, early childhood education, healthcare, and so many others. Um, there are so many ways. Um, I um, get asked a lot, "What's the best one? <laughs> what What do I have to do if I'm going to do one thing? Just tell me the secret. Whisper it in my ear. If I do this, I'm going to win." And the answer is, there's so many outcomes. Look at what the CDFI fund has on their application. I think that they really mean what they say when they say you can write a successful application um, on any of those outcomes, but you have to have a reason, a mission, vision, and values that backs that up. That's why you're doing what you're doing, and it's all aligned. Um, I have seen, I used to be, um, there used to be the whisper in the industry, you had to create, have job creation, or you couldn't win, and that's just uh, patently not true. We've seen several um, entities who've not had job creation as one of their outcomes and they have one in the new markets. Um, and again, I think it is really about figuring out your place in the world and not uh, look around and see what other people are doing, make sure that it's not something that is you know, already, already well, uh, well covered, um, especially in a small community. So if you're going to do it within a small service area and there's somebody down the road, probably not doing the same exact thing without coordinating with them um, would be advisable, but uh, there's a lot of room in this industry because I always uh, say we have not come up with a solution yet. Um, we have sometimes moved the problem. We have sometimes uh, changed the outcomes for certain communities and people, but we have not come up with the solution for how this is um, you know, going to be elimination of poverty and, and the need for this work. We've talked about this a little bit, um, but these are just a couple of examples of questions that we start with when we when we work with people um, and talk with them about adding a new product. This is what we've done also for our own business as we have um, grown from you know five people to fourteen people within our group. Um, what are we really seeing is needed? So I often say, um, do what you're wonderfully good at and capable, most capable of, but then, uh, you know, where are you missing? Because you're focused on something, where are you missing something? And, and then uh, how do you fill that missing hole? Um, if somebody is often asking me for something and help with something and I haven't figured out how to do that, do I hire somebody? Do you hire somebody? How do we make that work? So looking at, um, What's really needed in the marketplace? What are we really feeling like isn't done? Uh, you know, the CDFI fund raised the bar in a couple of questions they added to the application process in a, a couple of years ago, and they've really made it very clear you have to do underwriting. Um, some CDEs, um, I should whisper, were probably not doing that that much. <laughs> um, they relied upon others to sort of look at that a little bit more. Back in the early days, it was thought that, you know, the banks and others were really making that whole determination and, you know, not everybody needed to look at it. And the CDFI fund has been very clear in the application that CDEs need to take uh, that role on. They need to look at the projects that they're funding and see how those things can be done. So that may be something where you find, okay, you know, we were doing a great job on mission outreach, or we were doing a great job on underwriting, but we weren't doing one or the other. And so looking at where you are and where you have those things, um, you know, what keeps you up at night is often a really good question to ask yourself. Um, and how do you put that off of your plate? How do you hire somebody internally? How do you, you know, make that um, biggest worry um, sort of go away so you can get good sleep um, because we've got a lot of work to do. Okay, um, this is another thing that I <laughs> I find really interesting. Um, I uh, There are a lot of different types of plans. Um, I used to have somebody who would ask me about the SWAT um, and they, they just, that was what they were used to. And so they wanted to have all of the analysis done that way, or, oh gosh, how now we've heard of SCORE or SOAR or something else. And if you don't know what these are, please feel free to Google plans and you'll find that there's always somebody who wants to write a book and tell you about their new great way to plan. Um, I, I frankly find that um, it doesn't matter what you call it. You really need to just assess what are the strengths and weaknesses and what are you trying to do? And you can put it in any of the frameworks that really suit you. So looking at multiple frameworks uh, can be helpful because you can find that some of them may be 
centered more around negativity? What are you, what are the things that are going wrong? And some of them may be centered more around that positively, positivity. What are we trying to achieve? What are our strengths? And you may, as an organization, find that, uh, you know, doing a couple of different looks at your organization gives you a more well-rounded view. Um, I, I feel like it's, it's important to always, uh, you know, pick up the stone that you don't want to. What is the thing that is, that you're worried about, you don't know, at least write it down and talk about it um, because what you leave under the stone, you, you know, is, is going to haunt you later. <laughs> if you don't assess when you're doing a plan, why have I not gotten this accomplished already? Why, why am I finding this difficult? What is it that the key piece or element, uh, what is it that I don't know? What is it I don't know that I need to learn or hire somebody to teach us to be able to achieve the next, uh, the next step? Um, so, like I said, I, I, I don't uh, use one framework or another exclusively when I'm doing plans, but I try to look at the basics and I didn't try to come up with a new thing. I'm not writing a book. <laughs> so I didn't try to come up with a new acronym for all of you today. Um, because I'm a Gib, it would be a pretty bad one, right? Um, but <laughs> I really think you need to, as we've sort of covered in our, our previous slides, assess where you are, make a goal of where you want to go, think about how you implement, because I find a lot of people plan, but they don't plan with the steps in mind of where you need to go and benchmarks to, to sort of measure that success. So I think that's a, it's a pretty good summary of uh, where we're going. Um, and then this is a question uh, that I think really is determined based on each organization who is part of that planning process. And I find that it's really important for the leaders to think about where they want to go and what their missions are. But if you never engage the employees in that discussion, then you're probably not going to have as much success as if you go ahead and come up with a plan. That's what you're doing, your leaders, but then also engage others in that journey so that they understand from the um, accounting staff to the development staff, to the lenders, to the underwriters, to the leaders, to the people who aren't on the day-to-day -day lines, Everybody should feel like their job directly relates to that mission, vision, and values. And if they don't know what they're doing there that's furthering that mission, vision, and values, then you've lost them. So everybody should be able to see themselves in your plan. If they can't see themselves in your plan, then your job is just a job and they can get another job. And as we've seen in the marketplace lately, there's a lot of movement and ability for people to just go ahead and say, ah, you know what, I the grass is always greener somewhere else. But if you engage people um, and really make them feel like their job ties to the end results, the goals, and that they their voice matters, that they say something and that shows in, up in the plan, I think that that allows people to get more than just you know their eight hours a day um, from the job. Um, I think that uh, we 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 get a lot of grades as adults that don't come up in A B C D E you know Fs. Um, they come in you you won the grant or you didn't win the grant. You um, got a client or you didn't get a client. Uh, so really, I think the um, the question is. Uh, what are we trying to achieve? So if you're trying to get a new market tax credit award, you need to know that the CDFI fund is going to be giving you the grade. And so you need to understand how they're grading. If you're trying to get a technical assistance grant, that's a totally different application and program. What is it that's necessary in that program in order to get that grant? I think this is really um, something you can take to everywhere, um, whatever you're doing, and you can change that is who is who's assigning the grade. So maybe not, uh, we may not be in school anymore. We may, may not be getting that A or the gold star, but who is assigning whatever your grade is? And if you get um, the answer of no, how do you change that to a yes next time? It's important to have a growth mindset when you're thinking about growing a company. It's important to remember that that starts with yourself. Um, how do I improve? How do I change? How do I modify the plan in order to get from no to yes? Um, so we have um, talked about that fact that we we need to align our, our vision with both the external 
from a company, what's going on in your community, from the internal, what's going on with your with your employees, and then um, really thinking about um, alignment with the CDFI fund priorities as well. So assessing growth areas, covering blind spots, and uh, assessing organizational needs that we've talked about already. So that was a lot of information. I'm going to let you guys have a deep breath and pause and uh, think about how does your organization evaluate community needs? Do you use qualitative data? Do you use um, quantitative data, both qualitative and quantitative? Do you not know what those are? <laughs> that should be a that should be a, another one or not applicable. You don't you don't really um, worry about that yet. And frankly, that is perfectly acceptable for the answer to be D, not applicable, because uh, sometimes when you're thinking about adding this extra layer, you haven't been thinking about evaluating the community needs um, in your prior work. You've been thinking about it on a different framework. So pick one of those um, answers. And there's no right or wrong answer that's necessary for you to get your CPE credit. So if you don't know, um, just select whichever one um, and we can move on to the next slide. Hey, Laurel, I'll, uh, I want to jump in here real quick. We got a couple of questions um, in the chat. Great. Uh, and I, I'll take the first one here uh, as we have a little break here, and then maybe you can help me with the second one. Um, if an organization, the first question was, if an organization has received the $125,000 technical assistance uh, support from the CDFI fund, but has not made any loans. Are they a CDFI or are they still in the process? And, and I think that sounds like they're still in the process. Um, I would note that uh, CDFIs that are currently certified can apply for technical assistance support, and um, and they do quite often and use those funds to you know finance operations throughout the year. So it sounds to me, if they're not making any uh, loan activity yet, that they're probably an emerging CDFI that's uh, looking to get certified. And then um, the other question were, have, have studies been uh, done to prove out uh, the benefits of the new market tax credits to the communities? So there have been a lot of um, reports issued by the CDFI fund about the benefits to the communities. Um, and there have been um, various studies that have been issued. So there are and there are resources on the CDFI fund's website. I urge you to take a look there first as um, um, if you're looking for some data. Um, so I, this is a great, a great outcome of the polling question, both qualitative and quantitative data is, is really a great answer because um, there are th some things that you can measure and that's always best if you can measure your success, then you know whether you are um, going to where your goal and, and goal is. If you can't measure, then, you, then you're sort of in that blind land, but you also have some times where you know some things are um, worthwhile and working, but you can't, um, haven't found the way to measure um, those um, quant with, with quantitative data yet. So the anecdotal data is sometimes, uh, is, is I, I find sometimes one of those moving things. I, I often think about the, the qualitative change of one, one human. So when I think about early childhood education, to me, the, that, is, that is the one child because each child um, is precious in my calculation. And so I think about the one child that I'm helping. And so that's not a thing that I, you know, you can change um, and is easy to, to follow um, sometimes the one child. Uh, developing a roadmap. So after the organizational assessment, we've talked about um, where, you know, creating that, where do you want to go and thinking about how do I know I am um, working in the right direction? Am I taking the most direct route? Am I sort of uh, swerving and going sideways? And then how do I reassess that? If I am thinking to myself, I'm headed in one direction and then I look at the data. So if I've looked at that, if I, I sort of um, collect the data and I say to myself, I'm going to make this particular type of loan because I think I'm going to achieve ABC. And then I look at the data and I'm not achieving the results that I expected to achieve, then go back and uh, seek additional guidance and, and recalculate. But um, frankly, being able to create those concrete next steps, short-term goals um, that lead you to that long-term goal, um, and then assessing yourself along the way are important parts of that roadmap. 
Best practices, policies, and procedures. Again, this is where I say the CDFI Fund has provided us some really good guidance lately that they really want us to have, um, us as a community who's going to seek new market tax credits. But I would say overall, as organizations, even when you're not seeking new markets, but as organizations who is who are trying to achieve a something, having sort of that idea of what are best practices, what are the policies and procedures we should follow so that we know we're doing the best work and that we're making the best and most sound investments. Um, what is the minimum? Um, how do you know what you're really trying to achieve? And um, if you don't know what these standards look like, you know, seeking the guidance of others. So I often will say, um, if I was going to go run a um, a power plant, I probably wouldn't know what the best practices, policies, and procedures are for that, but I would hope somebody would hand me a manual. If I was going to have to go turn on, you know, open the door of that plant and walk in and, and run that so that I didn't, you know, cause a catastrophic failure and a shutdown in the community, I'd want to know that there are certain safeguards in place. There are certain benchmarks. I know that this is what's minimally expected of me, and this is what an A plus looks like, and be able to set those up. So if you're walking into a new industry, I wouldn't expect you to start this from scratch. You may have some things to draw upon with your past experience and your existing product lines, but if you're going into a brand new industry, you know, seeking the counsel of others and looking to what other people are doing, and then thinking about how do you bring your expertise from where you have been into the room so that we all are getting better. And that's that's one of the things I will give us um, props on in this industry is that we are pretty collaborative. We do have a working group that shares ideas and best practices. We talk about things. We have several calls where we talk about what would what should good underwriting practices mean? What what how do we achieve the CDFI five funds intended goals? And so there's a lot of sh uh, shared information out there, and I'd suggest uh, you get access to that and try to join in on the conversation. And if you've got some good ideas, share those as well. Um, I often find that when you get partway into thinking through these conversations with people, uh, it becomes clear either to um, to you or to others there are maybe some missing pieces. Or hey, maybe we should set up a new entity. Um, who is the controlling entity? Who's the entity doing what? Uh, you know, How do you parse that? Those are all questions that are very specific to each organization. Some people want to do everything in one entity, and that's really um, a strategic choice. Some people, every time they have a new thought, it's a new entity that's coming about. Um, and, and frankly, um, there's no right or wrong answer. There are some best practices as far as limiting liability across the organization, but but uh, frankly, at the end of the day, you, you still need to make this assessment of, you know, who is going to serve what role. And if you don't have all the entities necessary to successfully um, engage in this new practice to add on a new line, you know, should you start a new entity. Um, advisory and governing boards, which uh, Jason mentioned, you know, do you need an advisory board? Can your governing board serve as an advisory board? Do they meet the low-income community standard or by virtue of who they are um, in relation to the organization, can your governing board not count as an advisory board because there aren't enough low-income community representatives on that board? Um, so do you have to have an advisory board? Those are good questions. Often with small organizations, I will say that the governing boards wouldn't qualify. Um, as being advised as serving the low income community. So you often will need to set up an advisory board. And that's a process that's needed to really be assessed. Who do you want to invite in to your organization to hear what you're doing and to provide you with feedback? They need to be trusted advisors, but they also need to provide that element that you're looking for as far as that look into the community. So if you want somebody to be on your low-income community advisory board, but they really have no expertise or depth or connection to that low-income community, they would just be um, a, a member of your board, but they would not be a low-income community representative. And as Jason mentioned already, while you only have, have to minimally have 20%, because it is an advisory board in nature, we often see people achieving close to 100%, if not you know, at that 80% mark. So this is sort of starting to wrap up. We're getting to the end of our hour. 
Um, here are some potential benchmarks that we have assessed with other organizations along the way. So this is sort of a peek into um, you know, our process when we go through this. These are not um, set in stone, so this may not be your, your list, but we thought it might be helpful for you to see a list of you know, sort of what are some of the benchmarks, what are some of these um, pieces of the process we put in place because if you just go in and try to do a plan um, you know in a day with somebody it's exhausting and there's missing pieces so setting up a longer term um, road map for people thinking about this on a year-long or at least six month uh, planning process going back and um, iterating along the way filling in the missing pieces here are some of those um things that you want to achieve through your planning process. And again, smaller organizations may be able to breeze through this. They may have all the answers. They may have figured it all out. They may know all the answers to this in a much shorter time period. Um, but for those organizations that are you know, already existing and, and operating, it may take a little while to really assess, hey, do you have the internal capacity needed to add an entirely new program or platform? Um, gosh, by the way, we've been doing this for a while, but we didn't realize we should probably be collecting this data point. I now have to go back and ask all of my borrowers or clients or customers for data that I wasn't collecting previously. Um, hey, by the way, I really thought ABC employee could do this, but when I realized adding this to their um, to their plate, you know, sort of overloads them. How do I restructure what everybody's doing in order to make this successful and something that isn't going to topple the apple cart, but it will be, you know, so sort of additive and and um, engaging. Um, this is another question I get asked. Well, just tell me what I should do. <laughs> the problem is, is there's so many different ways, and frankly, this is where I really say, look at your service area. Where are you trying to serve? Are you thinking about just a small you know, a city? Are you thinking about a region? Are you thinking about a state or, a, you know, a portion of the country? Are you national in service? Uh, what do you see is missing? So I found when I was um, running a CDE that certain things were missing in different communities. So in one community, perhaps the tenants of my um, my new market tax credit finance project weren't being able to get those small loans to just fit up their organization, or they needed to be able to build from, you know, five employees um, up to that next level, and they couldn't get that, you know, that type of funding. But the answer was different in different communities. What's already existing in one community and thriving because some organization has taken that on may be completely lacking in another organizational, um, you know, in another region. So thinking about what, where is the gap um, within the, the communities you are trying to serve? And um, frankly, do you marry that with other work? So um, really thinking about that collaboratively and thinking about that along the lines of who else is in the community? If I if I find somebody is doing that less than 50,000, but there's a gap between that 50 and the 250, maybe I serve that. But I also partner with people who are doing that less than 50 and that over 250 so that I create an ecosystem and a pipeline so that borrowers can come back through the system and keep growing. Uh, this so this is and uh, that's sort of that next add-on is how do I how do I create that pipeline? Do I do it all through my own clients and who I already know? Do I reach out to others in the community? Do I have events where I invite others in to talk to me about what they're seeing that, that's missing or or needed? Do I um how else do I you know do I reach out to partners who are doing this and see how they're doing it? Um so for, frankly um. Uh, the CDFI fund received all these other grant programs and awards. So for a while, I think CDFIs have had a harder time making loans because there were so many grants available. You know, that won't be forever the case. Um, but there are things that change in our environment that then cause us to have to shift and think about where, where our borrowers and our pipeline are coming from. Um, and then, uh, you know, as the economic change times change for everyone, you know, this answer may change. So continuing to, to ask yourself, where do your, where do your key borrowers clients come from? So again, we're coming to the end of the hour and um, the end of our presentation. Really happy to have had you all with us um, through our four part series. Um, thanks for those of you who's joined us just for the first time today. And for those of us of you who've come multiple times to, to be with us, thank you for um, your time and uh, you know listening to our, our presentation. 
We try to do this work with our community partners along the um, uh, nationally, um, from project finance, which we had a presentation on, to management of CDEs, um, the strategic consulting and application writing. We really try to cover the waterfront. And um, one of the sort of keys to this is that it is, it's an ever-growing process. Um, raising, deploying, and managing capital is the continuous cycle, no matter what you're sort of doing, is you have to get the money and then you have to get it out <laughs> into protection. If you're a lender, you, you have to loan it, grants, you have to go get it, um, and then you have to manage that, that process. And then after you've done that all, you have to start it all over again. So it's um, I really, um, this is, this has been the thing in my head as far as um, it's not, and there's no end, <laughs> there's no finish line. And there are lots of benchmarks along the way, which is why I mentioned that, you know, there's, there are goals and there, then there need to be benchmarks because there is no end to the process. There's no uh, magic finish line that we cross and then we have no more to do. We just start the process over again. And frankly, to me, I think that that's the wonderful part of the work we've done um, as a community is that it is this evergreen um, process where we continue to learn, grow, and um, get better as we go. Um, as an organization, you know, we're really proud of the help we have provided to the industry and uh, to our clients and um, our community. Uh, you know, job creation is, is huge and investments throughout the, the country um, and working with the individual. So for me, it is it is um, that quantitative, the numbers, but it is also that one that one person you feel like you've changed the life of that sort of sticks with us and lets us keep going. The last polling question for those of you looking for your CPE, hit this and you are done. <laughs> Would you like to learn more about uh, how we can help you move forward? This is not unnecessary for a uh, yes or a no. Uh, you know, you can say maybe if you're not really sure about what you want to do, um, but do answer the question and um, um, so you can get your CPE credit. And thank you so much for joining Jason and I today on this presentation. Um, we have really enjoyed spending our time with you. And Jason, were there any other questions while I was going that um, we needed to circle back on? Um, we got a couple, and we'll try and get them in here just in the three minutes. You know, one quick question is, uh, what recommendations do we have for organizations in the small and mid-sized range that aren't already tracking, um, documenting demographic data and beneficiary data? How, what, what kind of recommendations would you give to that entity? Uh, so, so yeah, so we have clients that have been involved in this and don't necessarily track data. And so that is the question is going back and seeing what you can discern from, um, from clients that you've already served and then starting today. So there's no, there's no bad time to start. So if you haven't been doing this and you think that this is a, an industry you want to engage in, um, no, no better time than to start now, but there is the ability to go back and look and gather data from, from past experiences. So that's something that you would probably want to reach out to somebody to get some assistance with, um, or you can just, you know, give a call. If you know, you want to track certain data, you can just call your, um, your clients, your borrowers, and and try to you know work that through with them um, and and get gather that data. That's great. Yeah. I think that that is our very last slide. But um, um, well, oh, that, so sorry that you can. There's our contact information. Please feel free to call uh, or reach out to to Jason or I. Send us an email. Um, the information um, for this presentation, as as Maddie already mentioned, will be recorded and will be available to everyone after about a week. Um, this, the, um, I think there's a link in our um, chat today. If you want to go back to the registration site, that's where the prior presentations already live. And so if you're interested in any of those prior presentations, I am now, um, um, I have I'm now finally made it as far as my son is concerned. I am a YouTube star since I've done this presentation. Thank you all um, for your help in making my dreams come true. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, but yes, we are up on YouTube. We have the presentations there. And thank you so much, um, all of you, for joining us today. Um, we appreciate your spending your time with us. And look at that. I made it into 11.59. So as people who know me know me, I can talk. But I'm going to go ahead and stop now. <laughs> uh, and and um, we will hopefully see you all again another day. Mm -hmm.